Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm staying on here as chair for the next session, which is going to be a report from the Potter Institution, the University of Cape Town. Uh, while they're coming up, we'll be putting the podium back on the stage. Um, it's been a great privilege for me to work as a coach with the University of Cape Town. From the very beginning, I had a meeting with the uh, DBC, Academic Teaching and Learning, uh, and she strongly supported the initiative at the university. And she actually said to me, I see your job as coach is to keep UCT honest. By which she meant, UCT has made commitments, they've set themselves outcomes, and we want, I want you to help them to achieve those outcomes. So it was very nice to have such strong support from the DVC academy from the start. And it's been a privilege for me to work with the highly competent, very creative um, institutional lead and a couple of her sidekicks, I don't see Demokatsu here today. But I'd like to introduce uh, oh, Demokatsu Yuyan. You see, now I didn't recognize you in person. I only can see you on <laughs> Teams. <laughs> uh, so, the, it's a partner presentation, and we have the institutional lead, Ryashina, and we have back the student who talked yesterday, um, who did a wonderful um, presentation on peer advising, if you were attending that, Lebo, and we have the new uh, DVC Teaching and Learning of the University of Cape Town. So it's an honor to have you here as well, um, showing the importance of leadership in the projects that we are doing. So what the university is going to be reporting on is achievements in advising and data integration and working towards a student success framework. So thank you very much, Rashida, and to colleagues. Thanks, Wendy. Um, okay, this is like tall people privilege. Mm. <laughs> Hope you can all see. Um, so, Thanks, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, so today I'm going to be talking. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the achievements we've made as the University of Cape Town um, in, during our time being a CFO Malala partner. Now it's quite a challenge to uh, be told that you have to condense three years of very messy work into something that people will uh, be able to take some take-home messages about in about. But, you know, challenge accepted. Let's see how we go. So, uh, yesterday, uh, Murray, I don't know if you're still in the audience, aired our dirty laundry and um, showed you our achievement gap, right? So, in <laughs> 2019, our institutional data revealed a concerning trend. So, while we had an increase in graduate numbers, there was a decrease in undergraduate course success rates. But that doesn't tell you the whole story, because that achievement gap extends through a number of our different types of KPAs, right? K sorry, the <coughs> metrics, whether it's um, graduate outputs, whether it's the type of passes that students get. And so when we recognize, the, we recognize these challenges, and it was is with that background that we joined um, UCT, uh, joined Sia Pumlela in 2020. And our goal was to address these challenges. Our focus was on implementing evidence-based decision-making across all areas, including institutional leadership, student support, and faculty management, amongst other things, right? Over the past three years, we started to sort of August 2020, uh, and despite the pandemic, we've made significant strides towards driving this evidence-based decision-making at various levels. We don't yet have the data on impact, but I'm hoping that our next year Pumarela will be able to present those. Now, what we want to do is we, we realized we needed to transition from being a reactive to a proactive organization. And there were some very particular moves that had to be made in order to get relevant, timely data to the people who were best placed to take action. So this required assessing our existing systems and working towards a more integrated system that enhances efficiency. We needed to move from the ad hoc um, to really looking at systemic issues. And we wanted to move from anecdote to being able to support uh, our decisions based on data. Now I just want to acknowledge here that of course, Student success 
is a result of an interaction of a multitude of systems within and without the institution, right? So just acknowledging that. But today what I want to do is I want to focus in on the subsystem that we worked on, which was either enabled by our funding from Siopumlela or accelerated through our association with Siopumlela. So I'm going to focus on one subsystem. So I'm going to talk about our integrated analytics program, um, which provides accessible and meaningful data to support evidence-based decision making. I'm going to talk about that in a, a little bit of detail later. We also developed a framework for the ethical use of student data, recognizing that you know, there are obvious ethical concerns and regu regulatory requirements. So we needed a framework to, for responsible handling and management of the student data. That is in its final phase. To enable efficient action based on data, we have the Academic Advising Initiative. Um, and we've been looking at an integrated academic advising system which will engage existing capacity and then identify opportunities for integration. And then finally, and most recently, even though we've had a success committee from a, for a, long, from a long time ago, that the Data Analytics for Student Success Committee, which is that multi-stakeholder committee that's been talked about today, we have more recently formed the Integrated Student Success Working Group, which is a collaborative effort that involves even more stakeholders from both academic and administrative domains. Now, of these four pillars, I want to discuss the two that represent the kind of implementation of our work, and that is data and advising. And I'm going to start with data. So to achieve this integrated analytics program, the first thing we needed was a cross-functional team. And this team's purpose is both to promote the effective use of business intelligence throughout the organization, but also to make sense of the data. Um, and how it can become accessible to other people in the organization. So our team, you can see the list of departments represented there that make up our core DAS group, the Data Analytics for Student Success team. We meet weekly to discuss various issues uh, that are emerging within the institution, but we have a number of expertise from data analytics, ICT, institutional planning, research, teaching and learning, statistics, higher education management, data analytics and visualization, academic advising, and learning management systems. So together, this team works on a range of projects. Um, starting with COVID, this is kind of our launch into deep waters, uh, where we started with the emergency response initiatives. OK, so I just want to take a moment here. So what you're looking at here is an act, the access survey. So this was the survey that informed our laptop and data distribution response as an institution during COVID and the switch to emergency remote teaching. Now, while what you see is a very pretty picture, what led to this very pretty picture was a hell of a lot of work around data validation, understanding the business objects reports, being able to visualize data that academics could understand but that the technical reporters could provide the information for. Ken Kefale is the mastermind behind our data visualization specifically. So each of the examples I'm showing you today is, has sort of pushed us further along these different paths towards getting this data into accessible formats. So this was our access survey. Um, we then did a student experience survey. Um, student experience survey of how students were experiencing emergency remote teaching and that informed our return to campus initiative. We've also looked at student behavioral data through uh, our LMS activity reports and this is an interesting thing. Our, our previous LMS did not talk to our, our PeopleSoft interface to and, and feed into our business object state, uh, data house. So uh, other kinds of complications. And then also uh, for long-term planning efforts such as exam performance reports for which uh, further policy um, decisions need to be made. So now our strategy also involves what we call data democracy. And that is about encouraging individuals to engage with the data. So two examples of this work are our data dictionary, which serves as a repository for field and, reporting defi and report definitions related to admissions and student records, and then um, developing new reports in response to stakeholder needs 
uh, such as this throughput, uh, cohort throughput uh, report. Stakeholder engagement is prioritized uh, throughout our work and it ensures continuous collaboration and feedback, which helps refine our initiatives to align with the needs of the university co community. Now, we're very proud of this, uh, which is an outcome of this methodology, this iterative methodology, which is the Know Your Course and Students Report. This provides course conveners with valuable insights at the start, so before they go into the classroom, who their students are, start of the semester. Life companion document is included, offers definitions, explanations, context, and we have now also included the national benchmark tests, um, which with subdomain analysis for curriculum, uh, for, for, for people to look at their curriculum and how it's meeting the students where they are. And uh, it highlights very importantly the achievement gap for your particular course over the last three years. I've talked about our aims towards the achievement gap um, at the beginning. So finally, what the DAS also does, it actively collaborates with the um, academic advising initiative and provides them the necessary data for insights um, to support their interventions. Now the two blank tiles represent the fact that there's a lot more work to be done just at the start of this. It also made my image symmetrical. So. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to now talk about that other pillar, the advising uh, work, the academic advising work. So, here, uh, I've, we've heard a lot of partners talk today about, uh, talk this week about um, how they've used advising in various ways. We took a slightly different approach when we started with this. And we had at our disposal an already established baseline for understanding and uh, support of the institution because we were part of the CU Kumalela World Stream on Academic Advising. And what we did instead, uh, while building capacity in that space of professional advising, is we, understanding that our institution is highly siloed, decentralized, and our faculties work quite autonomously, we were looking for niches that we could adapt into, niches that were not yet filled, and how we could possibly create integrations within these niches. So we came up with what you can see, which is a kind of heuristic device that, that, that I'm constantly throwing at the team and saying this is what we're trying to do, just keep that in the back of your mind. And there are kind of four levels that we're trying to, um, to develop with this work. Now the first uh, is uh, informational advising and we've developed the UCT chatbot which provides this automated informational advising. Uh, we hard launched in 2021, sorry, soft launched in 2021. December 2022, we've done hard launch and we've had 25,000 unique users, almost 900,000 messages sent and received on the bot. And part of that is driven by internal collaborations, time dependent internal collaborations. At the moment, we are collaborating with the admissions office, and um, what we're able to do is reduce the volume of queries that are being sent by email. Another initiative, um, the second layer there, which is uh, referral, uh, is our UCT centra centralized advising and referral service. It's a single point of entry for a referral for students, and between August 2020 and May 23, uh, over 8,000 queries that require person to person engagement have been um, dealt with. The uh, Pambini suite of services, which represents our uh, pilots into curriculated development of who will be doing a presentation on that later today as well. So that collaboration uh, focused, as I mentioned, focused on academic recovery, and our data shows a significantly positive effect on retention amongst mandated participating students. So we've since, using the same model, launched a collaboration with ResLife to pilot a structured peer advising to enhance support within the ResLife. In terms of supporting the faculties, we have the Commerce Case Study, which started in 2020 as a collaboration with the Academic Advising Initiative. And being one of our largest faculties, what we've been doing is while studying and doing the baseline studies, developing resources, uh, working with them to develop tools, we're also looking at a framework for how we might evaluate student support in other faculties. So how do we take that methodology and uh, transfer it to other faculties. My DDC is the same. Um, <laughs> and so what I'm gonna do now, one of the keys to the success of our advising initiative 
has been um, the strategic use of peer advisors. So I'm going to hand over to Ms. Lebo Ntachi, who is an MPhil candidate at the University of Cape Town, specializing in program evaluation, and will tell us about her experience of being included as a peer advisor in the Pamili program. Good morning to all. Um, as introduced, my name is Lebun Chachi, and I'll just briefly talk about my experience of being part of the Pambili program. Being part of Pambili, the academic recovery and self-development program was an exciting experience. It launched last year, meaning we were the first group of peer advisors to get the program going and growing alongside the management team. Being part of an initiative in its early stages like that often means there's room and value for feedback, which was always motivating when I was compiling my feedback reports for my groups after every session. I won't touch on the benefits of peer advising because it would be like deja vu for those of you who attended yesterday's sessions, but I'll briefly highlight how I applied some of the learnings from my peer advising space into the tutorial space. As a tutor, the support and opportunities you are given through trainings and workshops are very discipline specific and academics focused, such as learning how to give detailed and constructive feedback to students and also learning how to write essays. Whereas with peer advising, it takes a more self-development focused approach. <coughs> An example of the focus on self was when we looked at appreciative inquiry for the Pambili program. Those sessions required students to look within and identify their strengths. As an advisor, I also had to help the students hone in on these parts of themselves that either I had identified or they had identified as their strengths and remind them to use them to their advantage towards reaching their goals. The skill was then transferred to my tutorial spaces where I was more observant of the space and the students and would try and draw out their strengths and encourage them to integrate their strengths in their studies. Secondly, being a peer advisor taught me to create a safe and comfortable space for the students due to the nature of the sessions with vulnerability being at the core. I took this tutorial, I took this to the tutorial space too, aiming to create a safe and inclusive environment that would be conducive for learning. Getting to be a peer, a peer advisor was an amazing opportunity and my biggest takeaway from it was learning to make space for others. I'd also like to acknowledge the team that we worked with because they also managed to create a safe and supportive environment for us peer advisors and that also carried us as we carried out our duties as <coughs> peer advisors. Thank you. Network, um, the members are the University of the Western Cape and the Cape Peninsula University of Technology and UCT is the facilitating institution. So we've coordinated our efforts and uh, in our um, time spent together we've had so far had four workshops amongst other parallel processes that have been happening and these uh, have been uh, to work towards a common definition of understanding of student success to develop ways to measure student success to understand uh, the factors that impact student success and to identify the types of support needle needed to enable student success. The reason why I mention this and then the parallel process is because, is because what we're doing as a, as a region at the moment is now unpacking. So what you see here are graphic illustrations of our events, but we're actually really unpacking the documentation, the transcripts, and what we are doing is coming up with a framing document about 
how we might go about looking at student success frameworks in our individual institutions. And so the plan is to take that work, leverage that work, take it back to our institutions, and then start to have those conversations within our institutions. Okay, so I've talked about um, those two pillars of success, uh, sorry, of, of work, data, and advising. Um, but we've also been working across these spaces. I'm going to talk about this very briefly. But what we have been doing is leveraging some of that data work and integrating with the advising work already. For example, uh, during our um, during COVID, the, day, the laptops, uh, the redistribution, the return to campus initiative, that was a direct collaboration between the DAS and the academic advising initiative where UCT CARES came on board to help assist with, with reaching out to students, contacting students and taking student queries. We've also looking at improving institutional operations with real-time data aggregation and reporting. The chatbot is one example of this um, in how we are doing that. So, for example, we're working with admissions at the moment. And when, the, when we get a number of queries, we have a live user um, platform as well, we are able to quickly report broken links or something wrong with people soft up the chain, get that fixed, and then uh, we're leading to um, less frustration from the side of applicants. We've also been using uh, uh, data from, for the developmental advising program. We've had fluctuating student populations in there. The DAS uh, helps us bring in the relevant data that we need about the students that are in the program. And then also, um, I want to say that this integration has led to the first investigations into student dashboards for advising, and that's a project we hope to pick up again. Um, we hope to pick up again. So these are just three examples of how we've been using data and advising. So for the next phase, we're looking at implementing two key strategies. We want a comprehensive data analytics framework for student data. Um, to, to look at, get valuable insights into factors that influence success, et cetera, et cetera. We also want to design and implement um, targeted advising interventions. Now, aligned with UCT's Vision 2030, what we as the Academic Advising Initiative and the DAS have proposed uh, is that we have a structural integration into a cohesive unit. Student Success Accelerator, for, for want of a better um, name at the moment, and this proposal would see the structure housed within the Center for Higher Education Development. Um, and so that is the vision, that is what we are planning to work towards going forward, at least that's what we're going to motivate for those of us that are working in these spaces. But I'm going to now hand over to DBC Cathard, who will talk a little bit more about um, UCT and its future. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, in addition to everything else that has been said, uh, I just want to add the importance of leadership placing student success as the highest priority for our institutions. And in doing this, um, what we think about as success is, for me, very critical, in addition to everything else that we've said uh, along uh, for the two days. Uh, the one being, absolutely importantly, the freedom to think. It is not just enough to pass, but the quality of student experience, their sense of belonging, and importantly, their well-being is paramount to student success. The other aspect that I think is absolutely critical to all of the work that we've been doing is that our students are agents of social change who actively reduce inequality in light of the social challenges that we face. So with this in mind, in terms of what we think about and what we do in the student success space, our team has spoken to all of the very, very critical initiatives that are currently active. What I want to do is just share very briefly uh, what we're doing in addition to promote student success. Now we know from the talk that Tim gave this morning how hard it is to move institutions along a pathway to change. What we have now is uh, the important project at UCT, which is our curriculum change project. Uh, it is a committed project for at least three years that we are implementing institution-wide. Uh, and 
this project is absolutely critical to student success. And the reason for this is that when we examine why students are not passing, we know that there are several issues. And what we're attempting to do in this project is to integrate all of those issues so that they don't stand as separate things that we have to do. Uh, they have to, for example, ask questions about program structures, program design, course loading and credits. They have to interrogate pedagogical choices that promote student inclusion and success, fair assessment practices, and very importantly, assumptions of learning in a highly unequal and diverse educational environment. <coughs> what, we, what we are doing and what we realized was a gap is that we need people with skills, curriculum change skills, to facilitate this critical process. And that's what we hear from faculties. We have the data, we know the output, but how do we get into the detail of what curriculum change is really about? And so we're in process of, uh, of training facilitators uh, to raise critical consciousness around pedagogy and around assessment practices, to look at which content we have, why we have that, and what does that mean for our changing and transforming society. So while we track and gather data about students, uh, it is very important that we look at this data to critically assess what systemic changes must happen. And that's something that we're actively looking at. Uh, there was mention, I think, in several spaces around policy changes, and to this end, we feel these are absolutely critical. Uh, we have an admissions review that is currently underway. We are revisiting our teaching and learning charter, our assessment policy, as well as our policy around digitally enabled learning as examples of how critical it is for us to revisit in light of transforming uh, education. What we also feel is absolutely critical are the stakeholders in these processes, students being absolutely important, industries, employers, as well as community members, other universities, etc. The one thing that we've picked up around the data analysis and the interpretation of data is what many of, of the people in our institution call analysis paralysis. And so what they're doing is that reading the data, interpreting the data, but actually not being able to work with it to translate it into implementation strategies. And that's a key area. And with the way in which we're approaching that is to ask questions, uh, really looking at uh, a, a philosophy of critical consciousness in terms of what questions are we asking and how are those questions going to help us to move on. Uh, the next point is really about the reminders of our deep-rooted colonial influences and on our educational challenges. Disability inclusion and mental health as a community uh, that higher education struggles with, patriarchy, racism, bullying, harassment, victimization, poverty, gender-based violence, all <coughs> in our spaces. And these are key issues that we must consider as we think about curriculum change and the quality of student experience as well as support. Um, we also know that the cultural context occupy where we are every day occupies a, a very important part of our change. And to this end, actively demo, uh, democratizing our knowledge spaces, mediating power relationships in teaching and learning, and celebrating and having respect for all voices who are involved in student success spaces are all key uh, and I do want to emphasize that our students being an invaluable part of our, our educational process and that the shift from a deficit-based uh, approach to student success is most heartening and so with that I think I'll, I'll leave it there and we can continue the conversation. Thank you.
No, I'm gonna be down.